Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us take a moment and examine ourselves and reflect on God's word. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the forgiveness of all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the feast of the people of our God.
the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when he had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father had fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the world. And when he had said these things as they were looking up on, he was lifted up. And a cloud took him out of their sight, and while they were gazing into the heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. These are the words of life. Thank you. The epistle is come from Ephesians 1, 15 through 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give you thanks, to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and of knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. These are the words of life.
our hearts. Be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. Do you know what one of the first sins ever committed was? It was using an excuse. After Adam had taken the fruit that his wife had given him and had eaten it, his eyes were opened up knowing the difference between good and evil. But he excused his sin. It's not my fault, God. It's your fault because of the woman you gave me. And the woman said, well, no, no, not my fault because the serpent deceived me. We have a propensity to use excuses when we don't want to do something or we get caught at doing something we know we shouldn't have. In the Garden of Eden, Adam was right there when Eve took the fruit for the very first time. His sin was one of, commit, of omission. He did not inter, intercede and try to save his wife. Eve's sin was one of commission. She actively took the fruit and ate from it. Interestingly enough, the one person involved in sin there who didn't give an excuse was Satan himself. Sort of interesting, isn't it? If we fast forward to when God calls Moses to be his prophet, to go to the Egyptians, what did Moses say? Oh, God can't do it. I'm not eloquent. And God says, I gave you a mouth, and I can enable you to use it. But God gave him Aaron to help him. But Moses' first response was, I can't, I can't do it. I am not good enough. I am not eloquent enough. And the, today's text sort of gives you the same scenario. Jesus had guided his disciples for three years, and he had led them through some very trying times. He had prepared them for each of them for their own ministries. He had died for them. He had rose from the dead for them. And now he tells them that you are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. And when the truth finally sunk in, they would, would be overwhelmed and they couldn't survive on their own. How could they do it? If you think about it, in a similar way, many of us think that God gives us tasks, gives us jobs that are difficult for us to handle. Whether it's getting your taxes done in time, cleaning up the house, getting the food ready before company arrives, we all tend to have excuses. I can't do this. There is something preventing me from doing it. There was a young man who was born in the suburbs of Denver. His name was Ricky. He had a medical condition that was commonly called club feet. Doctors assured his parents that he would walk normally with treatment, but that he would never ever be able to run well. And so Ricky ended up being one of the best cross-country runners in the seventh and eighth grade. And when his parents were asked for the secret of Ricky's success, they said, we never told him he couldn't do it. And that's a good reflection on the humanistic approach to life today. The theory that many of our children are being given is that you can do whatever you set your mind to, the only thing that will stop you is when you doubt yourself. And that's both optimistic and not quite the full truth. I'm never going to star in the NBA because I'm not tall enough. I'm not going to star in the NFL because I'm not fast enough. I'm not big enough. 
But when somebody says, I can't, they're usually, especially our younger kids, they're corrected with a pep talk. You can do it. It sounds good. It makes them feel good for a while. And so many people today are filled with a self-confidence that borders on self-absorption. Unfortunately, overconfidence and, full and false hopes often lead to feelings of disappointment and failure when those expectations aren't met. The disciples, they were frightened at being left alone. They tried to talk to Jesus into staying with them. And Jesus is basically saying to them, you can do it. You can carry the torch. You can carry the message of the gospel to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Jesus never pointed to his disciples to some inner strength. He didn't want his disciples to rely on some inner strength. He wanted them to rely on their potential in God. And God works exactly the opposite way that the world tells us he ought to. He knows what you and I are like. He wants us to be realistic with ourselves. Jesus said, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. That is the only potential that you and I are born with. So God wants us to realize that we are indeed weak. We don't have the ability to do what we want to do. Instead of pointing the disciples to themselves, Jesus gave them a different strength, a much greater strength. He promised to send them a source of strength and of power that would enable them to do more than leap tall buildings, as it were. They would have be given a far greater power to give speeches that have an unlimited potential. He had said to them, Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Although John's baptism gave the Holy Spirit, there would be even a more powerful baptism, enabling them to speak in languages they had never heard before. And this is what gave the disciples confidence. It enabled them to say, I can carry the torch of faith, not just to my neighbors, or to my friends, but to the very ends of the earth. And carry that message they did. By some accounts, some of the disciples reached all the way to India. They reached from Jerusalem to Rome in all parts of the Roman Empire. Jesus gave them the confidence. Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit because God was their foundation. God was their rock. And God also gave them additional encouragement. As they were staring up in the sky after Jesus had ascended, two men dressed in white stood beside them and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Not only did the disciples have this confidence that they had been given by the Holy Spirit, but they knew that Jesus would return. He would come back. And with the Holy Spirit and this encouragement by these two angels, they were able to say, I can do it. And God works the same way with you and me. All of you, each and every one of you who has been baptized, have been enabled to speak the gospel just like the disciples were. When we say Jesus is Lord, 
We are speaking a language that you and I were not born with. We were given it by the Holy Spirit. We were given it by God. It's a language that is foreign to your natural vocabulary. It changes our attitudes. It changes with God's power. We no longer can say, I can't. As long as the Holy Spirit is not driven out of us, we can say, I can. We come to realize that it's not dependent on us, but actually it's dependent on God. And God gives us that power. As long as we keep connected to the Holy Spirit through the Word of God, there is no reason for us to say, I can't. As the angel told Elizabeth, nothing is impossible with God. That is not if your attitude is correct. If you think, I can't do it, and you're relying on yourself, you're absolutely right. You can't do it. You can't. Remember that Richard Simmons isn't living in you. It's the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, who lives in you, who enables you to do these things. Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for this gift of the Holy Spirit. That may sound like an easy thing to do. But with the disciples, remember we call them the disciples, But have you ever waited for a vacation that was uh, extra special, or a promotion, or a holiday, or a graduation? We all know that waiting for those things isn't easy. But he, Jesus said, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. He allowed them time together as they waited for this gift. And that is surprisingly what they did. Now, if we look at the verses following today's reading in Acts, we read the following. They returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to a room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, Son, the James, uh, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and the Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. What is the significance of this? Why is this important? Remember that the disciples had been through a lot in the last couple of days. They had seen their leader who they expected to set up an earthly kingdom, leave them. And angels pretty much told them, don't expect him to come back immediately. They needed to hash this out with one another. They needed to struggle with it, to talk about it, to ponder it, and to come to terms with it. If they were left alone, they might have despaired. They might have begun to think to themselves, there is no way I can survive. But by meeting together with fellow believers, they were able to encourage one another, reassure one another. They were able to talk about the coming gift of the Holy Spirit with eager expectation. Instead of despairing, all of the disciples and the women encouraged one another, praying for strength. By allowing them to meet together for 10 days, Jesus gave them another gift, another reason to say that I can. They understood, they knew that they were in, not in this battle alone, but they had the help and support of other Christians to help them through the difficult times. And there were going to be difficult times in their lives. You see, the church works like a pile of coal, a charcoal in a grill. When the coals are all piled together, they feed off each other's heat, keeping warm and glowing. But you'll notice that if a coal somehow falls off to the side, it starts to lose its heat. 
and its fire goes out. That almost happened with Elijah. He'd won a great victory over the 450 prophets of Baal. And then Queen Jezebel threatened his life. And he, Elijah flees. He's left alone in a cave on Mount Horeb, hundreds of miles away from home. And in his loneliness, in his despair, we hear him say, I am the only one left. And they are trying to kill me too. But God reassures him. God says, you are not alone. There are 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. And with that reassurance, Elijah went back to accomplish his mission. And that's the way the Christian church works. When Christians are left alone, they quickly despair. When they fail to worship and serve God and one another, their faith quickly begins to fade and lose its energy. When they have the support of others, they're able to grow. Jesus knew this, and so he allowed the disciples those 10 days to feed off one another before sending them out. Now, if you've been despairing in your life, if you're wondering if you will be able to survive the trials and tribulations that you're facing today, let me ask you this. Have you been in fellowship with the saints as often as possible? Have you taken the Lord's Supper at every opportunity? Have you been coming to church consistently? Have you been spending time with fellow Christians participating in Bible studies? Have you been in the word. Those who are despairing are most often those that have withdrawn from fellowship. Life is getting more and more difficult, and it will continue to do so. In part, it's because we have not been energetic enough in bringing Christ's message to the world around us. One of the fastest growing faiths in the world is none of the above. And without a strong, confident, and faithful church, the devil gets more and more freedom. In this country today, we are facing more problems in marriage, in child rearing, in school, and in the working world each and every day. As you can see from today's examples, you desperately need one another, whether you'd like to admit it or not. Coming to church and helping out with boards and committees and chores isn't just what you get out of the service. It's you as a family coming together and encouraging and helping one another. When someone is down, someone else can help lift them up. When you have others encouraging you to say, you can instead of I can't. That's one of the great reasons that Jesus established the church. It's the very purpose of fellowship. Remember the next time you think about skipping out on Bible study or ah, I really don't have time for church today. Remember what you're actually missing. Now it's okay for you to say I can't. When you realize that you are a weak human being and that you need God's help and you need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit allows you to say, I can. The sources of the strength that will enable you to say, I can, to spread the gospel. I can raise my children. I can overcome the obstacles at school or at church. I can resist the devil. You know and you can confidently trust in this because you confess with his word. I can do all things through him who gives me strength in his holy name. May we always remember that and cling to our faith to life everlasting. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Please rise. Let us confess our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess, I believe in one God, 
Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. On the third day he arose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we worship God with our eyes and all. Support our pastors and uphold the ministry of the word amongst us. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, uphold all those who serve in law enforcement, who serve justice and are in the military, and those who bear the sword in our land. 
that sin and wickedness may be kept at bay, and we may live peaceable lives in security. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we pray for peace in Eastern Europe, that you may bring an end to the war and restore peace and freedom to the people of Ukraine. We pray for the children and young people there. Preserve them in body and soul from suffering and injury. We pray for their brothers and sisters in the churches of Ukraine and Russia. Keep their hearts from hating one another and show them ways to serve peace. Proclaim your word and celebrate the sacraments. We pray for all who have political responsibility. Direct their hearts to peace. Help them to serve truth and justice and guard the hearts and minds of the people from error and falsehood. Merciful God, keep us in your peace and grant peace to all people from whom we have prayed. Lord, in your mercy. Save and raise up those who are suffering and sick, especially Betty Romero, Vern Lake, Lila Griggers, Jason Palmeron, Martha Cisneros, Lee Makowitz, Lori Brody, Marty Brody, and Doris Hamlin. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you, Lord, for David Saramano this week of his birthday. Lord, in your mercy. Grant, Lord, that all who come to the altar today to receive the heavenly manna of Christ's body and blood would be well salted with repentance and faith and at peace with one another. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Also be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. He is God to give you the nation for us. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give you thanks for your boundless love. Show it to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally, because he has now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and the archangel and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper ended, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks and praise. He gave it to them, saying, Take all of you and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood of the new covenant, shed for you for the remission of all your sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance for me.
The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you.
us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary death, and we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his perfect peace. Amen. Please be seated for our final hymn. <laughs> Thank you.